Okay, so I'm going to begin. I'm Colleen Cook and I'm the Trenholm Dean of Libraries and I welcome all of you to uh, um, a town hall on reconceiving and reimagining the library of the 20th century for the 21st century. What we're about here today is trying to get input um, from all of you, from all of our library users on the needs that you have for library services, collections and space, trying to think out to 2050. So um, there have been three issues that I just want to talk about from the very beginning and hopefully I can put some people's mind at rest, but I can also make sure that we make sure that we have enough time to deal with hearing from everybody who wants, us, who wants to give us their ideas on how we can, how we can transform the libraries for, for teaching, learning, and research discovery for the mid part of this century. So the first is that we know that people are still smoking on the terrace and we're trying to do our best for, for people to be self-policed. We know that that's an issue. We don't like walking through the smoke either. The best thing to do is when you see it, just to remind people that it is a smoke-free area. Um, the second is that we know we have only one entrance to the library right now. It's a matter of, um, it's purely a matter of budget and uh, security, and I can talk to people about that more at length. But what that's not what we're doing today. What we're doing today is asking you to tell us what you need in the library of the future, 50 years out. Um, and the third is, is I know that the, a number of the members of the music faculty and the students of music and those of us, all the rest of us who love music, are concerned about Red Path Hall as a performance space. And I would, um, I would like to reassure everyone that we are quite aware of that. Um, I'm going to ask Stefan, the um, chair of the Department of Performance Studies, to read a statement from, the, from Sean. Sean and I recently just walked through at lunch, walked through all of this space, and he understands now what we're about. And it's not something I think y'all are partners in this. I think that, that we can accommodate everyone's needs and it could be a spectacular space for everybody. So Stefan, please. Um, Sean, of course, would have liked to be here. He is on his way to Europe right now, so I'm happy to read this statement uh, from him. Uh, Sean writes, uh, I regret that I am not able to attend today's town hall discussion on the future of McGill libraries in the 21st century. I fully support the library's desire to explore new methods and means of delivering their services to the university. Some members of the community have expressed concern to me, often with great passion, regarding a phrase in the library's scope and vision document that refers to the re repatriation of Redpath Hall to the libraries as a reading room and exhibition space. Having been in contact with both the library and the university, I'm fully confident that Redpath Hall will continue to serve as it has for half a century as a cultural, academic, and research resource for the Schulich School of Music, the entire university, and the Montreal community. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. So um, I want to, I'm going to introduce a few people here. I'd like to introduce um, Robert Couvret, who is the Associate Vice President for University Services. And Robert, if you can stand, he is, he is the person um, ultimately responsible for all of this, as he is for all buildings and such services on campus. And all of those, um, the feasibility study managers report up through Robert. So I just want to make sure that you could place a name and a face. Um, so I am, we are, the university has contracted with architectural firms to do a feasibility study. The feasibility study, well, this is the second time that they, that the architects have all come from Shep, Shepley Bullfinch is the oldest architectural firm in the United States. Uh, they are partnered with EKM, a local architectural firm here in Montreal. Um, so we have a Quebec partner, and Shepley Bullfinch has a very deep, deep experience 
uh, working at universities and particularly in reimagining libraries at the sorts of places that are our peers, MIT, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, Duke, uh, just to name a few. They have a, a very, very deep experience in, in all of these sorts of not only renovating his um, heritage sites in large big cities, but all sorts of um, all sorts of reimaginings of library spaces. Um, what we will come up with at the end of this is a series of meetings that will go on for six to eight months, seven months or so. Uh, there will be three options for re-envisioning library spaces and services, and then a decision will be made to do very large design work of um, large-scale design conceptions of what this might look like after those who are in decision-making authority at the university decide which one that we like the best. They like the best. So I'm going to quickly introduce Jan Jeanette Blackburn, who is, um, who is uh, with Shepley Bullfinch. She will introduce her team, and Francois Imond from EKM, who will introduce his team. And then we'll, then we'll begin to, I will turn it over to Jeanette, and she will show you a small presentation that will help you get an idea of what we're all about. Thank you. Thanks, Colleen, for the introduction. Uh, Ms. Colleen said, I'm Jeanette Blackburn. I'm a principal at Shepley Bullfinch. And I have with me here today Jay Verspeek and Barak Yaryan, who are both architects um, and my colleagues at Shepley. And uh, you'll uh, be hearing them speak a bit today as well. And then we have Francois uh, Imond from EKM. And he has with him uh, Andy Covina and uh, Raquel uh, Penosa. And that's all you have with you today. And they are um, not only uh, well-established architects in the city of Montreal, but responsible for some of the design work in this space as well as out on the terrace, right? This space. Yes, this space and the terrace. Yes. So um, it's been a great partnership, and we're really pleased to be working at McGill. So um, I'm here to start to show you some pictures about what we're seeing in terms of libraries in the 21st century and the range of issues um, that surround those, and to play back a little bit of what we've heard so far from McGill in the way of themes. We were here, um, I'll just start here um, with a little bit, first of all, about um, each of our firms. This is some of the work of Shepley Bullfinch, as Colleen mentioned. Um, working across North America, a bit in Europe, um, projects that reimagine libraries and learning spaces. They um, tend to keep the tradition and the identity of the campus, but also speak very strongly towards um, new initiatives that affect learning and research. Um, and EKM, you see the space you are in, um, as well as other um, scenes from McGill where they've been working. Um, so we were here about three or four weeks ago, um, and we met with maybe 150 or 200 folks on campus. We met with a couple of student groups. We met with library staff. We toured each of the libraries. We met with some of the deans. Um, and so we are starting to get a little bit of a flavor of what uh, your group, your community is about, and we're looking forward to hearing more. We're now at the second meeting, so this is still very much the beginning. We're listening, we're gathering data, we're gathering input. We don't presume to have the answers or even understand everything yet. We'll be continuing to work uh, through this process through into the spring. Uh, term and will be on campus, um, I think, a total of six times. Um, so as we think about the library from our perspective, we're really, because we're an architectural firm, we really are looking very much at the spaces that the library occupies. And um, what we find is that many libraries, including uh, this one that we're in, were really conceived um, in an era where a library had three distinct pieces. It was how to find space for staff to do their work, how to create places for people to read and use collections, and how to house the collections themselves. And what we're finding in the 21st century is that a library is much, much more 
dynamic and indeterminate and there is no one size fits all. There's no one model out there for what an academic library should be. And not only does it need to change in terms of the very, very wide variety of activities it may encompass um, with each institution, but it changes and evolves over time. So we're looking at models that um, have a great deal of emphasis on all kinds of user environments, not just reading. Um, they have many, many auxiliary resources and amenities, cafes and event spaces and exhibit spaces and performance spaces that complement what they also bring in terms of resources that are not only print materials but also technology resources. And that's what makes it so exciting to start to imagine what this library could be in the 21st century and what types of physical changes really need to happen to keep on to what is really good about this complex, but also to remake and rethink the parts that are not so flexible and don't serve you well anymore. Um, so just, these are just a few environments that we're seeing in libraries. Certainly much more emphasis on creating collaborative workspace of all types, enclosed space, open space. You know, this space and many of the others that, um, that have been renovated in this building recently address some of that, but our sense is that there still needs to be more. We heard a lot about that from students last time we were here. Um, and then those combined with spaces that still emphasize the importance of the library as a place for inspiration, for contemplation, to be alone, to do your work. Um, the image on the right of Johns Hopkins University, they are actually going back into their main library and creating new classic reading rooms for that kind of quiet signature space that um, associated with a library um, that have maybe disappeared over the years. Um, and then we're looking at collections as being a much more complex diagram. Um, there are certainly still the need for the visible presence of books and browsable collection, but those are being complemented with um, a whole variety of new high density storage systems from compact shelving that you're probably familiar with to robotic retrieval systems and kind of um, warehouse type uh, environments that store very, very large amounts of um, infrequently used collection that needs to be maintained over a long duration of time. And what we're finding is that most, I think almost every academic research library of the size and caliber of McGill that we're working with has a combination of these. They have both print materials in their libraries and they also have the high density, the remoter storage areas to just be able to maintain the quantity of collection that they want to have available in a way that is uh, um, achievable and efficient and appropriate for their campus. So um, then in addition to print resources, we're also seeing that libraries are bringing in through partnerships with um, information technology and other groups on campus, many, many more robust technology resources, visualization resources, um, uh, places where gaming can happen, where simulation can happen. Um, and they're doing that because when those resources are in the library rather than in a department, they become available to all. So they're trying to invest in technology in a way that it is um, available and accessible uniformly across campus. These images are of the new library at North Carolina State University. And they are also bringing in many more blended services, many more spaces for teaching, for partnering with uh, um, academic support services such as a writing center or a, a math lab. And um, this happens to be a space at Duke University that is used for teaching space during the day and at night it's opened up for group study, for collaborative work. It's the 24-7 space on campus. Um, and then we're also seeing a lot of research partnerships um, at Johns Hopkins University. The uh, software that is being developed by the Whiting School of Engineering, which is a, a motion um, sensing software, is being displayed and tested in the library. 
so um, that aspect of sort of engaging with the community beyond um, the walls of the library, but bringing into the library examples and um, um, connections with the resource across research across campus. This is at Duke University again. This is um, a cafe that they've um, created that can also work as an event space that creates a um, very lovely space to study as well as to meet. It brings faculty and staff and students together in a common gathering space. So those are some of the things that others are doing. Um, we are also have started to gather and reflect some of the feedback that we heard from our visits here a few weeks ago and organize it into themes. Um, so we have the theme of access um, of all types, um, discovery, certainly a library is still a, space, a place of discovery. It, all will, it always will be, it's becoming broader in terms of the, uh, the types of discovery that can now happen there. Um, variety of spaces and the identity, really thinking of the library as a place that is uh, distinguishable as a center at McGill. So um, in terms of access, Jay, do you want to speak a little? Uh, yeah, uh, so just the, the question of access, we heard a lot about that uh, the last time we were up and, and the fact that you, know, you kind of have to loop around the, the campus and to go into one door, uh, the difficulty of just even finding the front door. But beyond that, entering, once you enter the front door, you know, how, is, how are the resources made uh, visible and, and, and the wayfinding within uh, the library clear so that there's a kind of understanding of all the resources um, that can be available. So, and even uh, thinking about libraries less as, I mean, this library really is quite an introverted uh, building. You're either inside the library or not. Uh, where can there be those overlaps where um, things like uh, exhibit and uh, uh, events can be kind of part of the front door experience or, or open, uh, extrovert, more extroverted and, and open to, to the outside world? Um, and then uh, apart from that, um, how can we think about you know, spaces upon entry that, that just sort of allow that um, uh, ability to understand and read uh, what all uh, those resources are uh, that are in the library. Um, so it's, uh, yeah. The next theme. Yeah, and um, just the two examples there. The top one is the um, images of the Brody Learning Commons at Johns Hopkins, and the bottom one is at University of Delft, right? Yeah, yeah. these are the main spaces. So you, you enter, you understand right away a kind of, a kind of range of availabilities. Yeah. So uh, the next scheme, uh, next theme was discovery. Um, we talked a bit about this, about um, discovery being very broad in terms of certainly encompassing a range of print resources and technology resources, um, and really becoming a place where there are um, spaces where uh, interdisciplinary groups can meet, where people can come around, um, together around research. They have at hand the expertise of the library resources. The image on the top is at University of Calgary. It's um, a facility in their library, a visualization studio that um, provides opportunities to work with a very, very large high resolution uh, display for um, all types of academic research. Um, and then variety, I think um, the one thing that is constant on all the libraries we work with is the appreciation for a very large range of variety in terms of spaces to study and to work from uh, classic reading rooms. Again, this is a new reading room that's been created at um, NC State University um, to smaller scale nooks. Uh, that will support uh, either group study similar to what you have here. And um, so one of the things you know, we've observed in McLennan is that as you go from floor to floor, there isn't really a lot of variety in order to be as efficient as possible. There's kind of one space type in there. You do have some variety in some of your branch libraries, which is really lovely. And um, we uh, really heard a lot about having that. If you're going to spend a lot of time in the library, having ways to move and to change your outlook and your environment. So I, I just wanted to yeah. talk a minute about the question. Uh, this is a theme that came out as well. Uh, 
the notion of identity of the library on the campus. So um, uh, just how does the library, what is its meaning in terms of the overall campus as a place for people not only to work uh, uh, and, and through it being a sort of a, a shared space for work, how does it then become actually a, 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 a something that builds community? And um, so thinking about uh, uh, the meaning of that and how we can be creating uh, public a public place for the community that is secure and comfortable. Um, and so uh, images on the right really here are a project we're doing at, in Richmond, Virginia, uh, in addition to a, a very kind of defensive uh, building in the 70s, uh, creating out of it um, something that's much more transparent, much more visible, well, from the outside, you can see kind of the activity within uh, reading rooms on the top floor that become destinations, uh, campus uh, that, that, that invite, invite the, the campus in. Um, so, and, and, and so the idea of sort of the campus, uh, the library as a kind of um, uh, focus or hub on the campus. So, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, coming back to McGill itself, I mean, we want to be very careful to understand what is what is special about about McGill, and and the the complex that we're in is uh, part of a heritage of buildings that have happened over a sequence in time. Uh, it really kind of is an embodiment of of sort of the the history of library design <laughs> through the the late nineteenth century into the twentieth century, um, and and. As we look at uh, Old Red Path, um, which is a, a beautiful building, much of it has been buried. Uh, how, are there ways we can be uh, uh, revealing it and bringing it, uh, uh, actually embellishing it and making better use of it? Um, and also, uh, as we look into the future, um, understanding you know that this is a kind of a collage of buildings, this complex, and what is this next sort of 50 years? What are we bringing to this site that really represents <clears throat> the next 50 years um, of McGill? And so it's about, as much as anything, hopes and aspirations that, you know, what, is, what does this university want to be? Okay, and that's the end of the prepared presentation here. And I think, uh, do we have a system for how we're going to open up for comments and questions? Um, yeah. People can queue up at the two mics, please, if you have questions. And what we'd like really is for you to give us your input on what you think, how do you want, what do you want the library to look like? What services do you want in 50 years? How is this, I know that you're leaning into your crystal ball a little bit here, but um, just give us your ideas. We're here to listen. That's what, that's all we're doing right now is listening. So if you go to the microphone and queue up that, we really appreciate it. Yes. Hi. Hi. It would, it would also be good if you just said your name and, and what discipline you're in. That will help us. Great. And if you're a student or faculty for yeah. me, thanks. Yeah. Uh, my name is Adelaide. I am going to be graduating with my Master's of Library and Information okay. Science at the end of this year. Uh, I'm hoping to find a job in an academic library. And I guess my, the main thing I pulled out of the presentation was that the, the learning commons mm -hmm. are great spaces, but are they a library? Mm -hmm. Is the, the use of all this technology in a building that we associate with books and text and the written word really the next, the next step of libraries. Because the one thing that I noticed in all of the pictures is there were no books, mm. nowhere. Oh um, no, that's not true. There must have been some books. There were books on the collection slide. <laughs> <laughs> yes, books on the historic slides. Um, but as yeah. someone who will be yeah. working in libraries mm -hmm. for the next 50 mm -hmm. years, yeah. I feel books are still a very important yeah. medium for students. And the, the importance of serendipity browsing versus having a call number in mind and going to the shelf and getting that book or having a robot get that book for you. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of lose that magic of finding something in the library that really can kickstart your research. Research. So I'm just wondering like, what, what, how the books will be addressed in the changing of the libraries because I also know that I've been learning in my classes that libraries are becoming more of these learning, mm -hmm. 
learning commons. And so the books are getting shift, shipped off site and you have to request them and it takes a while to get printed word. Um, so I guess that's just one of my opinions about what the library should still have as someone who's going to be working in a library. Yeah, that's great. And it's a great observation that, you know, I would say it's, we'll have to get more slides with pictures of seats next to books that it's not that the books are all going away, it's that there's so much more that's being added. And then how do you balance all those resources where there are disciplines where almost none of the scholarly research is done using print resources and there are other disciplines where it's still very heavily dependent on it. So for um, the library, it's the challenge of creating that flexibility and that diversity that, that balances all of those needs. It's okay. really important. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Oops. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Robert Doucette and I'm the stage manager for all the music events that happen in Red Path Hall, the 150 oh, or so yeah. concerts. And yeah. trying to look forward into the future, yeah. um, it is a spectacular space, it's one of the mm -hmm. nicest buildings on campus and we're constantly mm -hmm. getting requests for how can I rent this space, how can I have my <laughs> event in this space? Yeah. And the, yeah. the answer simply is there's just too much going on in that space yeah. right now. Yeah. So to try and reimagine, to look forward yeah. as to how we could possibly possibly share this space as a, as a performance space, as a rehearsal space, as a recording space, as a space for, for events such as Iron Ring, yeah. which is a very Masonic ritual where the, the, the engineers get their, their, their rings and their cards for yeah. gas discounts and whatever <laughs> else they get. Yeah. Uh, I just, yeah. honestly, yeah. I, I don't have time. My office is yeah. there. Yeah. I, I rarely there because I don't have time to be in there because organ teaching and practice is going on. Or special, event, or special events is setting up the book fair, or you know, or I've got to run between two halls because, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's two or three rehearsals that day for a concert the next night. Or I, I really, I just, I I know that you want to hear what we think the library should look like, but this statement was a bit of a bombshell. The repatriation of Red Path Hall. It sounds a little bit like you know Russia repatriating Ukraine. Just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't make the statement, first of all. Second of all, I think everyone here appreciates how heavily used uh, Red Path Hall is. And what we're looking to do is not negate any of the things that are happening there. And obviously, you can't move the organ because it's integral to the space. And you can't have a reading room in a space that is acoustically designed for organ performances because it will be too resonant. So I, um, I think what I really would like people to, to help us with is that is an incredible resource on campus and what links could there be between that space and the library if it stays as a music event and performance space, what supporting things might the library have that could work in concert with it to create um, a stronger identity for both, both uses, library and the music performance space? It's, um, there's a lot of uh, libraries that are now combined with those sorts of performance spaces and event spaces, and they are very, very successful. Things that come to mind for me are, for instance, um, exhibit space um, that the library has links with um, humanities programs that are exploring music and art and culture and how could those start to be paired with the events that you have happening there I think it's an incredible resource that you could start to strengthen um, as part of this that's does that help well that? a little bit but I think yeah. what would settle a lot of <laughs> certainly the music faculty yeah. and students nerves is just how you saw the sharing of the space. If it's not a completely taking over the space and turning it back into a reading room, and yes, we know it was originally the reading room, uh, but I heard that back in the day that everyone didn't like it because it was too resonant, but um, yeah. just right. how, yeah. how, how do you see 
the, sh the space being shared. If Well, that's great news to hear that you see concerts still happening there. Yeah. And obviously, this, this pipe yeah. organ that was a gift to the university has to stay there. You know, morning is the reading room and evenings are concerts? No, or I, don't think, I don't think you can use it as a reading room if it's designed as a performance space because the acoustics of the two spaces are at odds with each other. So I think that what would be happening is a, a partnership around examining that event and performance schedule and you know, it should be full all the time because it's such a fantastic space. So if it's full all the time and we understand that there are rehearsal and teaching needs related to the organ usage that also have to be accommodated and can't be accommodated anywhere else. So I think um, it was never in my mind that we would share the space in terms of literally um, trying to put library reading and study functions in that room. I know it was in an RFP. I didn't, as I said, I didn't write the RFP. What I do think would be really powerful is to create links so that you have this incredible event and performance space and you have incredible library cultural resources that are adjacent and can, st and that, that Red Path Hall then gets rejuvenated because it's now accessible and visible not only to library, not only to music, but to library and through the library. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Another person for music, Marta sure. De Francisco, yeah. professor of sound recording. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what another of the uses of Red Path Hall is the use as a recording and research in sound space. Uh -huh. yeah. And it's essential for us this is not just a place that where organ rehearsals and organ yeah. teaching takes place, which is very important, mm -hmm. but it is a place, or, or not only for, for concerts and performances, but also a place where we do recordings. We mm -hmm. are dependent on the acoustics, on the large acoustics mm -hmm. of this space for doing the recordings. It's not something we can do somewhere else. We cannot just take equipment and right, right. Yeah. make ourselves comfortably in a corner in a dry space. It's a performance. It's just something that's essential, the acoustics of that large space. So we're all very concerned with, uh, the, with the possible um, perspectives of this space being changed acoustically or being taken away during the day and only open for performances because we also do teaching and we do research. And uh, so it's for us, it's absolutely essential. So noted. And we do understand the sensitivity of the acoustics of the space and that changes to materials or configuration or even furniture could upset the balance of a concert hall yes. or for an acoustical research space. Record. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. My name is Catherine, and I'm in both literature and music. I have a double uh -huh. degree, uh -huh. so I'm very torn because <laughs> I have a great loyalty to the libraries at McGill, but also to the concert space. And while I totally hear what you're saying, and I understand the sensitivity will be maintained, I do worry, and this was just one of the things I noted in the um, presentation, that in our anxiety to make spaces useful in a number of ways, mm -hmm. we make spaces that are jack of all trades, mm -hmm. master of none, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and some spaces are spaces for concerts, and because mm -hmm. they're not, it's a musical performance isn't an exhibit, mm -hmm. it's a performance mm -hmm. that requires the space. And a library is oftentimes a place to get books and to be quiet and read, and non-interdisciplinary when, mm -hmm. when you want, it is a place of discovery, but it's also a place of study. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So I just, yeah. I understand, but I just want to make yeah. that fear known. Right, I think that's important, and it speaks to that point about variety and creating those places, maybe I didn't say it clearly enough, but for deep, focused research, as well as the places that are for more casual interaction and um, you know, balancing that among the study spaces. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Adam Finkelstein from Teaching and Learning Services. I'm not going to ask a question about music, so if there's anybody <laughs> else who wants to ask a question before I divert it to something else. Um, there, there's an interesting phenomenon, I think, at McGill and any urban campus where we have lots of different connections with identity. So one of the bullets you had was that the library is the backbone of the campus. 
And in many ways that is true, but we have disciplinary neighborhoods that are very, very interesting where we have sectors of campus where people are intersecting in lots of different informal ways. Mm -hmm. We have residences, we have both residences on campus, we have off campus, and when we have the city of Montreal all surrounding competing mm -hmm. sort of for that identity. Mm -hmm. So my, my question is that, you know, one of the things about changing from a library to a commons or a learning hub or learning yeah. space is to include more members of, a, of the community that were originally thought of with a library. Uh -huh. um, one of the things is, is I, I wonder, when the books leave, will the faculty also leave coming to the library? Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's a question of how can we ensure that, that, that the library maintains its backbone by having that intersection point where students, faculty, and staff I would not want to leave that out as well as, a, as an intersection point to talk about and to discover learning. So how can we sort of work through that and, and still maintain that given all the different competing identities yeah. we have? I think that's a great point and one that we should spend some time researching. Hello. My name is Andrea and I'm a librarian here. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm glad that one of your major themes is access. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to um, put out there that I think it's really important to involve people with different ex uh, experiences and needs mm -hmm. in every stage of your planning process, mm -hmm. um, specifically people with different disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to point out to everyone in the crowd that we're actually in a fairly newly renovated space that's not physically accessible. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and this building that we're in, this section of the library is very challenged in terms of levels and access and connections, and um, those are certainly some things, things that we'll want to look at as we look at new proposals. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name's Alexander Elias. I'm a cognitive science student, uh -huh. and uh, I speak on behalf of the 800 McGill students who are enrolled in the Facebook group Open the Red Path Doors when I say that. <laughs> The correct decision was unfortunately not made regarding the closure of the doors, but it's easy to reverse. And I call on the library to please somehow, I understand the budgetary pressures, et cetera, but um, that door is more important, I think. I think there's, there are ways to accommodate, given the schedules of the security guards, to add some hours, you know. I think it's not infeasible to find the, the savings to keep the door open, and it would be a great benefit to uh, all the people in this community. Great, thank, thank you. you. Yes. David Lank, I'm a professor emeritus and a director emeritus. When they built this building in the flush of enthusiasm, did they anticipate being able to add three or four floors to the existing structure without having the whole thing fall down? Do we? No, they didn't. Oh. McLennan, McLennan is capable of yeah. Oh, it is. Okay, so yeah. you, how, how many more floors could you add, assuming you had the money? Two. Two. But this structure, no. No, okay. So, so there's two things that um, factor into it. One would be, of course, budget, as you mentioned. Yeah. The other is um, the city zoning um, stipulations. And, and we are doing an, an analysis of all of that to understand the potential. Montreal politicians can be reached. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, I, my name is Sue Laver, and I am the director of the McGill Writing Center. So I actually feel a little bit spoiled right now because you actually did mention the writing center mm -hmm. in, or writing centers in general uh, in your opening <laughs> remarks. Um, so unlike people in Redpath and um, the Faculty of Music, um, it seems as if the writing center is being uh, reimagined as part of this new uh, development. Um, I just wanted to stress um, that we also think of writing as a kind of heartbeat. It's the common activity of work at universities. And of course, there's a natural relationship, uh, one that we have um, explored very successfully with the library between research, mm -hmm. study, and writing. Um, so we're currently located in Red Path, mm -hmm. and I've, one of my questions is, uh, there are a number of units, in fact, who are uh, currently occupying library space, 
And I'm, so my question is procedural. Mm. Will there be a point at which um, the people occupying those spaces will be involved in uh, consultation, any decisions that might be made? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I think we're, again, we're, we're up very high and we're trying to address all these things like that to make sure that they are attended to. So thank you. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Joel Peters and I am studying organ here at McGill and as well as uh, I'm a student of philosophy. Um, I have two questions for you. Yeah. Um, the first is in regards to the budget. We've heard a lot of things about we can't keep the buildings open, we have all these projects we can't finish. How is it feasible to begin a new project with the current budgetary um, restrictions, and especially with the email sent in fall with um, the vice president saying how we need to address budgetary issues in a new way, and this is a challenge, mm -hmm. and yet we're um, coming into this new architectural challenge that is extremely expensive and extremely ambitious. Um, and my second question is in regards to the favoring of some kinds of education over others, mm -hmm. why the um, current um, space, which is used for groundbreaking studies and mm -hmm. performances and is used extremely well, and why this is getting shifted to the side, and why um, what are, and what is the justification for replacing this space? So let me um, let me take your f your first second question first, and mm. I believe that I I already made it clear that it was not on my radar screen that we would turn take the organ out of the performance space or change it into something other than a performance space. Yeah, I understand that. Um, I would like though an example of a library with an organ. Well, wouldn't it be cool if, so, so, so the, the spaces, as I understand, admi administered by the music school or the music mm -hmm. department, and it's a central campus resource. Um, so, yeah, I don't think a library would be um, managing an organ. There probably is an example if we looked hard enough, but that's not um, what's being uh, proposed here at all. Um, and in response to your first question about funding, I just uh, also want to do a bit of expectation setting that we are at the very, very beginning of exploring what might needs, need to happen. We are nowhere near an architectural project that is going to start to accumulate dollars and resources. And um, I think it's a, really a duty of leadership of an institution to, even when financial times are difficult, to continue to look towards the future and to have plans and aspirations in place so that when they are possible that they can be um, moved forward on. Um, otherwise, you can't keep a place relevant and vibrant. So, so I think that's what, the, that's what the administration is trying to do by moving forward and looking, starting some conversations about this. But do we have justification for the removal of the performance hall? I didn't say that we were going to remove the performance hall. I'm not sure where you're um, picking that up. I thought I'd said clearly actually several times that that's not um, what I have understood. Sorry, my mistake. So, thanks. Hi, my name is Stephen. I uh, have spent my studies at McGill and uh, my whole working career in and around McGill. I have a question in terms of, and I, I appreciate the comment you've made a couple of times that you are really at the very, very early mm, stages, yeah. probably below ground floor uh -huh. in terms of any kind of plans. One of the things I think about from time to time relates to McGill's heritage materials. In other words, those things that McGill has that nobody else has in the world. How does sort of that mm -hmm. fit into yeah, your plans? Yeah. That's a really great question. I'm so glad you brought that up because um, the special collections and archives, and you have some tremendous ones here, are becoming uh, really, really premier collections and uh, very strongly linked with the institutional identity at most of the campuses we're working with. And um, so we would expect that type of attention to those spaces here as well. Thank tremendous you. Tremendous potential, yes. Thank you. 
Uh, Peter McNally, uh, the History of McGill Project. I come today uh, wearing two hats, actually. One as the university's historian, and the other one as, um, as a member of the university's Heritage Committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Heritage Committee uh, has, is in the middle of a massive project um, evaluating all of the university's buildings from a heritage point of view. And we're in the business of classifying them in terms of their priority. And I say this in the background that we're in a province and in a city that takes heritage very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. And of course, the city of Montreal has some very, very definite ideas about ranking heritage uh, buildings from a heritage point of view. We have three buildings here, basically. Uh, the, um, the, the old uh, Taylor Red Path building, um, the size building, you mentioned, I think, three architects, but the real architect was a man by size. And uh, this 53 wing of Red Path where we are now is considered to be one of the outstanding examples of post-World War II modernism. And then McLennan Library, uh, which, of course, what can we call it? It's, it's br brutalist architecture. But, uh, uh, but, but as brutalist architecture goes, I want to assure you that it is generally considered to be an outstanding standing example of yes. brutalist <laughs> architecture. Yes. Um. Now, having said all this, um, there are these um, elements of classification. Um, the heritage uh, classification is not meant to be necessarily a straitjacket, but the fact of the matter is, is that the historical, aesthetic, design qualities are, I would suggest, also elements that in your, um, um, in your organization, in your pattern, in the elements for you to take into consideration, I would suggest is also a on, on something else which is should also be considered these buildings as historical yes. objects yeah. and um, and particularly with these two wings of red path library which are so dramatically different yeah. but yet it's very hard to imagine that one could honestly argue that one of the sections has aesthetic or design priority over the other yeah. and uh, they're a funny mixture but the truth of the matter is is that in itself this has ended up becoming uh, a, a monument, uh, and a, a, what would you call it, an art of, uh, um, as an artifact, a, um, a something of significance. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, my name is Kari Palani Levitt. I'm an emerita professor here. And when I saw the announcement about the designs for library and archive, uh, I decided that I would come to ask a question about the archive. Mm -hmm. And because I want to tell you, four years ago, the director of the archive approached me and asked me if I would consider archiving my entire professional, personal life since uh, whenever, whatever material I might have. Uh, and that project began, and it went very well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, for various reasons, which we don't need to go into on the McGill side, on my side. Uh, you know, not much was done for a couple of years. And when I returned to this project, I was devastated to discover that the archive has no staff. There was a, um, somebody acting as head of the archive, uh, but it seemed that there were no, there were no human bodies there to to continue with this work, uh, I now have 75% uh, of material in the archive and at least 25% that is not. Uh, and um, I really came to ask if in all of our new technology, we think we really can dispense with people. <laughs> well, um, not in terms of... Um, Certainly not when we're archiving paper. Um, I'm not a librarian. I'm an ar um, architect, so I will, um, you know, maybe turf that to another conversation at another time that you want to bring up with uh, library leadership about that. Well, perhaps uh, yeah. somebody from that department is present, and I would like uh, to speak to them. We mentioned heritage. I don't believe that my work over 50 years is an important part of heritage. But nevertheless, uh, but nevertheless, um, I do believe that the archive also 
consists uh, of the uh, work of various professors that have passed through this university mm -hmm. over all of these years. And if you could assist me to put me in touch with somebody who could assist in solving this problem, I would be uh, grateful, and I think so would other people in the same situation as I am. Sure. Um, just contact me. I will help you. Uh, Colleen.cook at mcgill.ca. Okay, so um, I want to make sure that we're hearing comments. The, the topic here is um, what you need from the library, what you think the library should continue to provide and provide that it isn't providing now in terms of um, the study and research of the institution, um, things that would be good for all here. And so I want to make sure that we um, get through a variety of topics here. Who else? Would like to come. All right, I wasn't going to ask another question, but I figure I will. Sure. Um, you know, coming from a teaching and learning unit, we are particularly interested in classrooms, and we're particularly interested in improving as many classrooms as possible as we can on campus. So uh, I can look up at the six floors and the hundreds of thousands of square feet and imagine phenomenal classroom spaces that could <laughs> be used for our, for our faculty and for yeah. our students. So my question would be is that how do you envision us as a community coming together to sort of determine what percentage of space yeah. will be used for what and how, what the most equitable right. way that you as an architect who've done a lot of different <laughs> other spaces yeah. that you've gone down that road? Um, that's a really good question and we're doing a, a, some benchmarking now to understand and identify all the needs and then the most pressing ones. Um, and so, you know, we'll have more information on that as it evolves. Yes. Um, I'm Gwendolyn Owens, and I'm responsible for McGill's Visual Arts Collection, which includes the portraits in Red Path Hall. Uh -huh. um, and I just, uh, I have something to say about nuance in your, pr in your presentation yeah. that's a suggestion. Uh -huh. there, are, there are lots of examples that you give that I think are, are very, are interesting. I think what I want, I was hoping to hear more in the examples is how you work with a faculty when you okay. design a yes. gaming area yeah. Yeah. or something like yeah. that. I, I wasn't hearing an, yeah. enough of that. I'm sure you did. Yeah. So yeah. it's just a, a suggestion. Yeah. And also, the more that I think I, I'm an art historian, the more mm -hmm. I hear about how like institutions also mm -hmm. resonates mm -hmm. with me. Mm -hmm. So an example from Hopkins, mm -hmm feels to me stronger because I know a McGill student, someone coming to McGill might also be applying to yeah. Hopkins. Yeah. So if we're comparing like yeah. with like. So that's yeah. my other suggestion. Yeah. yeah, and we have been doing some benchmarking um, with like institutions. Um, with regard to um, interaction with the faculty, every library project um, seeks faculty input that we work on. And we started that with some um, faculty groups um, at our last meeting out here, and we'll, you know, continue to be seeking faculty input. Yeah. One Starting last. at a high level now and then becoming more specific as we move into details of spaces. Yes. You mentioned the, uh, the special richness of our special collections. Yeah. And every university prides itself and helps yeah. build its own identity around. Yeah. There's a reluctance to share sometimes, but with the advent of distance learning yeah. and with the electronic technology that's available, how do you see getting other universities that are facing the same kind of problems, mm -hmm. and McGill, how it's going to share its richness without losing its identity? Yeah. So um, what we're finding is that as institutions start to make their special collections digitally available, it's actually increasing use. Um, it's increasing awareness of the resources and it's increasing an interest in wanting to see the real tangible um, artifacts. So I don't see the, the digitization and the online learning as something that, um, that damages identity. I see it as something that um, increases awareness and is an opportunity to showcase that uniqueness. Yeah. Hi. My name is Katherine Peterson, and I am at the Schulich School of Music. I'm just wondering, uh, you keep saying that you did not write the statement that was released, and I'm curious who wrote the statement and why it was released before consulting with the Schulich School of Music. If you could please address this.
You know, I've um, let me take responsibility for it. You know, that, that's probably just the best way to say it. Um, when you write a scope and a vision, you're just trying, for a feasibility study, you're trying to say we're going to explore what is the best for the community as a whole. Um, it's not, there are, there have been a number, I've been here for four years, there have been a number of times uh, when, when we have all talked, many of us have talked about how we can, um, all universities, um, all universities strive very hard to be excellent at what they do and their spaces are incredibly important to them. What we have to do here at this incredibly symbolic space on campus is to make sure that we honor all of these needs together. Where good people, smart people, with good will and reasonable people come together, you can do a whole lot. And that's what I ask everybody in this community to do. We, libraries only exist for users. We are here not to alienate anybody, not to take over anybody's space. Libraries only exist for everybody. You know, all of you belong to us. You belong to your faculties, but all of you belong to us. Um, th that's, that's really just all I can say. I can't, you know, we talk about provenance in libraries along a lot. I don't know where the provenance of those exact words, so aim it at me. Okay. But uh, um, I can tell you that Sean Ferguson is, the deans are all pretty close. I mean, we really are with a couple of them here besides me. And we talk a lot. We aren't enemies. We, we compete in a very friendly, established way because we're all community citizens in the end. We have to be very strong advocates for our own spaces, and we are. But in the end, we, we make things work, and we, we are respectful of one another. And that's where Sean and I are, you know, so... Hi, uh, my name is Duncan McDonald. I'm a music student at the university, but actually my question isn't about uh, Repath Hall. Um, uh, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm asking about is uh, your past um, projects at other universities and the deep storage that you've undertaken there. Um, I assume that that's not just taking uh, materials from just one library in particular, but from right. all the other branch yeah. libraries in, um, in that mm -hmm. university. That's right, yeah. Um, how did that affect the other branch libraries? Because yeah. we've been only talking here about McLennan and right. Repath, right. that complex, yeah. but I assume a deep storage uh, kind of facility would take material from all the branch libraries. Right. So how would that affect the other libraries, yeah. and how would those spaces yeah. be? Um, right. Reimagine. So we haven't really started the mm -hmm. anal numbers analysis, mm -hmm. but you know the process is that the library will look at l very low use materials that mm -hmm. they need to move out of central libraries in order to create space for things that need to stay in the libraries, whether it's more frequently used print materials or um, more seating space or more technology or whatever. So um, you know, that's how that balance will be achieved. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know, there's not a plan to take the entire collections of some library, including really heavily used ones, and just take them mm -hmm. all off campus. It's, it's much, much more nuanced and mm -hmm. uh, you know, looking holistically at those pieces. Um, yeah. do, you, do you have an example, though, of uh, how that, like, at one university, sure. how, that, how that changed? Like, did some branches sure. tr yeah. change more than others? Yeah. Or? yeah. So, for instance, we've been working at Brown University on a similar study. And um, Brown has um, a humanities and social sciences library. They have a, special, a standalone special collections library, a music library, and a science library. And the science library um, encompasses um, life sciences um, as well as medical um, school health sciences collections. The health sciences collections, the print collections are very, very, very low use. The majority of the resources they are using are electronic 
they have um, you know, some use, obviously, of historical collections that are only available in print. They um, actually, what they did was take about 30% of the sciences collections in that science library and move those into off-site storage to open up more space for grad carols for medical students who didn't have libraries and uh, didn't have offices and needed um, focused workspace. And then in um, the humanities and social sciences library, it was a much, much, much smaller percentage. I don't have the exact number, but much smaller because of the disciplines they were, u they were promoting, they had a much higher use of print materials. Mm -hmm. So that, does that help yeah, that, with that, the illustration? Yeah, that gives a, yeah. a, a bit of an idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, so thanks. it'll be that kind of analysis. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Radoslav Zuk, uh, Emeritus Professor uh, at McGill in Architecture. Uh -huh. I had a question. Uh, you had, uh, you've shown all these university libraries. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether you looked beyond university libraries. Mm. I had the experience of working uh, several times at the British Library in London, mm -hmm. the new British Library. It may look like a, a Far East uh, Club Med from the outside, <laughs> <laughs> but, it, yeah. it, but, it has, but it has a wonderful variety yeah. of distinct spaces, yeah. the identity of that wonderful collection of books which yeah. you see at the entrance. Yeah. You, and I can imagine yeah. a concert hall fitting into that um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. complex as well. Yeah. Yes. I, yeah. I hope that you'll look beyond the North American eastern seaboard uh, continent because the examples that you've shown, I, I was sitting very far away, yeah. they all look sort of like the same kind of uh, contemporary plastic, uh, glitzy thing, and <laughs> I hope that maybe my colleague spoke of the heritage of McGill, uh, that yeah. maybe that could uh, complement and enrich the future project. Yeah. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Grew, um, professor emeritus and uh, university organist once upon a time. Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, I loved what you said about using collections to show inside and get inside. We did this when we opened the hall, or reopened the hall, I should say. Peter will remember it, Fran will remember it. Uh, the organ is a copy of a French classical organ from France. This is New France, it's not Boston. <laughs> and I have relatives in Boston, so no problem with Boston either. Except we were allowed to sing and dance and have organ music, and you weren't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the 175th anniversary of Montreal is coming, 2017. When we opened the organ, the exhibition was called Témoin de la Vie Musicale en Nouvelle France. And uh, this brought many materials from our wonderful collection and the archives, you've spoken about them. And maybe this is a question of staff or lack of staff. We did it twice, actually, in the 80s. And um, <clears throat> the curator of that, uh, Elizabeth Gallimoran went on to get a PhD in musicology and write several books and uh, has become quite famous as a result of that exhibition. Uh, the exhibition, the catalog still exists, it's in print, and uh, this was wonderful. We found things, um, I think, Fran, was it Eric Ormsby? I, I, I'm trying to think. Was it Eric at that time? Um, or maybe it's before Eric, I'm just not sure. Oh yes, of course, of course, right. So that's, uh, and uh, of course, when we reopened the hall, which had been closed for seven years, um, the, uh, the speaker was Dr. Stanley Frost, and the, uh, the hall was designated in that speech as the university ceremonial hall, thanks to the gift of the organ, which was anonymous at that time. So uh, 
everybody knows subsequently it was Dr. Huntington Shelton, who has been a great benefactor to McGill and to Johns Hopkins. <laughs> um, so there, there is a wonderful thing here that happened with that exhibition, and I think it was we uh, then remounted the exhibition in the McCord Museum a few years later, and we actually took it uh, to Quebec City. So I'm just thinking 2017, um, the 375th anniversary, mm -hmm. Montreal, and we have a French organ, which at that time was unique in North America and uh, gave us a head start in many ways and put, put McGill on the map in other ways. And the, our archives are a rich, rich source. So I, I'm just thinking out loud, yeah. can we remount this exhibition again? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and bring people into, the, through our exhibition, what you've just said, bring people into what we're doing in music. It's a whole cultural thing, and the thousands of people that go through Red Path Hall uh, for musical events and ceremonial events every year. Yeah, it's really, I mean, it's really a shame with it. Red Path Hall is such an incredible resource that there's not kind of a, uh, uh, it's the way it's now as a library has grown, kind of just positioned as the tail end, it feels um, a little remoter than, remote to the central campus green, and if it could be connected with some of those sorts of cultural spaces, I think it would really strengthen the um, visibility of, Red Path Hall and the use. So, great idea. Yes. Hi, my name is Fernanda Maki. I'm associate professor in language, literatures, and cultures. And uh, since you were asking about what we wanted to yeah. see, yeah. one of the things that I think that you mentioned that I wanted to reiterate is that they need to think the space for the use of rare books. Yes. I think that the library now. It's clear that it needs that, and uh, thinking a new design is mm -hmm. fundamental not to overlook that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is a question that I imagine you have the numbers, and I was wondering what is the per percentage of space used now for books and for people, for readers, yeah. for usage now in the library? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you think that will be will in the new design? Yeah. And if there is a trend, if you could share some numbers sure. from yeah. other universities. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, so anytime you give someone a number, it's stuck in their head for a very long time. Um, I would say that, uh, let me start with sort of um, a typical 21st century library model. And my guess is that McLennan Redpath is pretty close to this. Um, it's about 50% of the space is used to store print collections, 25% is for staff, and 25% is for seating. We did a analysis of all 60 libraries at Harvard University one year and measured the spaces allocated to each of those three categories, and they were remarkably consistent because they were all really had their primary development in the 20th century. What we're starting to see libraries do, and again, you know, there's differences with disciplines and institutions, all kinds of things, but they're starting to um, shrink the collection footprint through looking um, more critically at how they're using central campus space. They're not shrinking the collections, they're shrinking the amount of space they're using to store it and they're um, reducing the amount of it that's stored on the central campus in order to create more space for um, user seats. So not more staff space, but more space for um, people to study and work within the library. And that's the trend we're seeing. We don't have, we have um, universities that are going to the point where they're flipping it so they have 25% um, for collections and 50% for seating. And we have many libraries who are not able to do that, but they're maybe at something like 30 to 40% for collection and the balance goes into seating. So, you know, there's, again, there's not a sort of new 21st century formula, but those are the kinds of trends we're seeing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do 
I have no idea. We're nowhere near um, understanding that yet. Yeah, um, that would be like MIT is uh, at about that. Yeah. Hi, my name is Carolyn Samuel. I'm with the McGill Writing Center. In a library of the future, I would like there to be better temperature control across the, <laughs> the rooms, very simply, and um, also better air quality. Yes, That's all. so noted. <laughs> My name is Barbara Lewis. I work at University Services. I'm staff, and I'm also on the same Heritage Committee as some of the other people mm -hmm. who have been speaking today. Um, when these three structures were originally built, this was a road, a traffic mm -hmm. road. Mm -hmm. And it may not be evident now, but I'm sure you're aware that it no longer is. It's a pedestrian area that we're mm -hmm. hoping will become more and more open to a variety of activities and, and making this kind of a student corridor for student services and student mm -hmm. activities. So mm -hmm. I'm just raising that as something that I mm -hmm. hope will be kept in mind because yeah. it wasn't part of the idea when these buildings were first built. Right. Yeah, we've talked about that. It's really important to understand how all the floors at street level relate to the surrounding campus um, pedestrian and, and vehic vehicular routes. Hello. Hello. Uh, Ahmer Wally, medicine, first year medical student. Uh -huh. uh, I just want to, in terms of what the library would be like in the future, when I first came to McGill, the, um, I went to McLellan Library and both the Islamic Studies Library and both struck mm -hmm. me as very different spaces, but mm -hmm. they were both very awe-inspiring to mm -hmm. someone who hadn't mm -hmm. been to a lot of libraries before. Mm -hmm. And I would like the libraries in the future to retain that, mm -hmm. to be spaces that inspire, that are events and 